So next up is Bill McDonough. Um, uh, Bill is going to join us by video. He's a leader in, um, well, he'll tell you, in Cradle to Cradle in Lifecycle and has gotten deeply interested in picking up on what you just saw on the global sustainable implications of rapid prototyping of the built environment. So, Bill, can you hear and see me? Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me, Neil. Uh, yes, can you hear and see me? I can see you fine. And, and I think it's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here. Are you going to be able to see these slides, or are they going to be small like that in the corner? Um, w well, we can swap them. So uh, why don't we start by introducing okay. you, and then we can make them bigger. So Bill, go Great. ahead. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, Neil, should I introduce myself a little bit? Uh, please, I couldn't do justice to you. <laughs> um, well, this is a very humble presentation by an architect. Uh, I'm trained as an architect, um, and I'm going to talk about cradle to cradle and housing. And it's interesting where when Neil said life cycle, because we actually don't use the terms life cycle for most things because they're not living. Um, we make a distinction between biological and technical nutrition, which you'll see. So we talk about next use. And so when you think of something, instead of saying end of life, just think next use. And certain things are going to be back to the biosphere and certain things back to the technosphere. So um, I've just been appointed chairman of the new Meta Council for the Circular Economy at the World Economic Forum, which is where Neil and I met. So these ideas of circular economy, you'll hear from Ellen MacArthur soon, you've heard from Hannah Jones, these ideas of materials and systems that are coming back into human utility over generations is a really critical one. And today, Neil's asked me to talk about something that I'm speculating on and dreaming about, which is I'm calling the Wonder House. Uh, and the reason I call it Wonder House is because I wonder about it and I think hopefully you will too. Um, sharing these things even at a preliminary point like this reminds me of Benjamin Franklin when asked why he released all his ideas freely as quickly as possible. He said, I seek to attract the ingenious. And I think that's really what this is about, sharing and sharing with the ingenious. And so please bring your ingenuity uh, and help us here. So Neil, that's that's why I'm here. Good. Proceed. Okay. So the idea of the Wonder House is that wouldn't it be nice if we could build a system for buildings, a system that uses locally available materials to make cost-effective components that can be assembled into safe, secure, expandable, and attractive homes by families using simple tools at hand. In other words, it's a very little idea, which is, wouldn't it be wonderful if three billion people could have access to safe, dignified homes that match their cultural and, and physical needs and expectations? At the same time, uh, it is just a system, but it's a bigger system. And the materials at hand become the materials of our time and our space and what is available. And also, not only just what is available, but what is available at a negative cost of goods. If we think about the first industrial revolution, essentially the fact that the trees, the fact that the water was essentially free means that uh, for the taking, let's call it, um, that we ended up with the materials essentially at a negative cost of goods. So in this day and age, how would we start to think about what is available when we don't have trees for spanning, uh, we don't have steel everywhere. We don't have all the materials of tension and compression necessarily. We may have, you know, mud bricks available for walls, but do we have spanning members and tension members for, for roofs? Do, uh, can we afford heavy roofs if we don't have structure? Can we afford skins of various kinds? So that's what I want to play with. And sorry, Bill, Bill, so if we look uh, at the next I'm your remote control, yeah. yeah, so let me know when you want to advance. Next slide. Go ahead. Let's go. So let's take a look at a material that's at hand, 
um, and with a negative cost of goods. Well, here's a negative cost. We did a quick calculation for this presentation. And we looked at one set of data, which if correct, indicates that if we take the world's trash and we piled it on Barcelona, the pile every year would be, um, or every day, would be about 100 kilometers. It would be like packing a stack of garbage on Barcelona 100 kilometers tall every day. Barcelona as garbage can. Now, if we think about that as a material at hand around the world, don't forget this would, within four years, would reach the moon. Um, if we start to think about how this, this idea that these materials are actually at hand and that we're still designing packaging and so on that is not recyclable, the 25 top award-winning flexible packages in the United States last year, of them, not one, not one, could be recycled, if you can imagine. They were seven layers of plastic with dissimilar materials and so on. So let's take a look at this as a material at hand. Next, another material at hand that we have in this day and age for ourselves are, are examples of things that are coming from either biomimicry or from our work in the biological sectors as a, as a species. This is Ecovative's mushroom uh, root installation. And these are experiments that we're doing right now uh, in New York State on how to use mushroom roots to fill walls with acoustic and thermal insulation at various levels. This is being used for packaging right now by Dell, but is potentially there for insulation. So we're studying all these things as a part of our ongoing uh, research into potentials for materials. Now, next, if we look at the uh, notions of cradle to cradle, which I co-developed with Dr. Michael Braungart, German chemist, uh, over the years, uh, we look at the world through two lenses as metabolisms. One is the biological metabolism, that would be represented by those mushroom roots. The other is the technical metabolism, and that's why we might say, for example, that this uh, computer that it is using that we're using today is not a living thing. It is a product of service. It is in a use period, and it can be designed for more use periods. It doesn't have an end of life. It has an excuse. So cradle to cradle defines the world as biological and technical nutrition. Next. So we also look at clean energy, clean water, social fairness, things like that. So the fundamental protocols that we postulated in Cradle to Cradle, building on some, a set of uh, principles I wrote in 1992, the Hanover Principles, was waste equals food. Eliminate the concept of waste. Not just minimize, avoid, reduce, but eliminate the entire concept of waste. Use natural energy flows and respect diversity. Our new book, The Upcycle, from last year, is looking at Cradle to Cradle through the lens of everything getting better. And so we now use the term, everything is food. Food for material, food for energy, food for thought. And then we also look at celebrating diversity, not just respecting it. I'm working on a building in Barcelona that will have decoration that is butterflies hatching in the lobby walls that are released by children into the city. So the building itself can actually support biodiversity. And instead of just respecting diversity while it disappears, we can actually celebrate it by creating it. Next. So when we look at most charts today, people talk about reducing their badness, and they tell us this is their plan. So people will say, reduce your carbon emissions by 2020, reduce your toxins in your product, and so on. And our goal seems to be zero. Having a goal of zero is like me telling you that, you know, I am, I am jumping in a taxi telling it not to go to the airport. I'm saying, this is where I don't want to go. The question becomes, where do I want to go? Next. So I think we can take the things we don't want, put them below the line, and say, let's get rid of the things we don't want. Toxic materials, uh, carbon in the atmosphere, good examples. And our goal of zero becomes noble. Our path is up to the right. It's a positive one. But at the same time, what if we could articulate positive goals next? and start to think about what we do want. So when you think of the Wonder House, think about the idea of let's get rid of the things we don't want, mountains of trash, 
certainly being burned, putting antimony trioxide in the atmosphere, et cetera. And what we do want, safe, healthy housing for our families. Uh, next. And so we put this into a chart that we use all the time for upcycling and where the undefined universe is on the left, the intellectual filters are that black, uh, that black comb like the balinable whale. And then we sort things into what we want to get rid of and what we want to do in the future. So we inventory, we assess, then we optimize. And our goals are 100% good, not just 0% bad. Now I'm not saying don't, don't uh, please stop being less bad. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's insufficient. Being less bad is not enough in this day and age. You can't get to where we want to go by just being less bad. We need to be more good and can be. Go ahead. So the idea is reduce your energy consumption of the negatives, increase the positives. Now, as an architect, I have the privilege of doing what we call practicing architecture. And we call it a practice for a reason. We are practicing. So when we look around, I just want to show a few projects to give you a sense of what you're about to see with the Wonder House idea. These are buildings that I've designed that um, represent some of the thinking that we do. On the top right, hidden by me, uh, for Hannah's benefit, Hannah Jones, I think you've heard from, is Nike's European headquarters, which where Nike removed the PVC in 1990s, in the middle of it. Imagine that, just do it. Um, on the right there with the meadows is YouTube's headquarters in San Bruno, the ancient meadows of that part of the world. Below that is Make It Right, I mean, I'm sorry, is the Ford River Rouge plant at the time, the largest green roof in the world, over a million square feet, 100,000 square meters of habitats, uh, saving the company $35 million by restoring habitats instead of using chemical treatment plants. The lower left is a new center for the study of the future of the oceans in Los Angeles at the port of LA, kind of looks like an iceberg sliding into the water. Um, now above that is a new factory in India that uses um, Every BTU of gas, hopefully biogas, is used nine different ways to make everything from electricity to heating to cooling to food to carbon dioxide for growing food to oxygen for the workers to water out of the air uh, and jobs. It does nine things at once. And then the top left is the new space station I designed for NASA at Mountain View, California, a building that can make 120% of the energy it needs to operate from renewable power and can purify its own water a building like a tree. Humans at this point need to be immensely humble by design. It took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage and it took us another 20 years to put four wheels on our luggage. So um, humility is important here. And as we look at this wonder house, we wonder what we can do next for the people in the world that could celebrate some um, decent homes. And as a warm up for this, uh, Brad Pitt and I created something called Make It Right in New Orleans, where we brought homes to people who, were, where, who, who had homes and lost their families where the, where the levee broke in New Orleans. And we brought many architects from around the world to help us and to design homes for the people to return to their own sites, uh, lifted up safely above the floodplains, living in flood housing. Next, they have very low mortgages. $400 a month and their energy bills are $20 a month because they're solar powered. So the idea was to thinking about Buckminster Fuller as an efficiency uh, 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 person and at the same time thinking about effectiveness because the question becomes not can I be just efficient, the question is can I be effective because a manager's job is to be efficient and do something in the right way but the executive's job is to do the right thing and be effective because if you're doing the wrong thing efficiently, you're, you might be worse. If you're a criminal and you're efficient, you're worse. So, so being wrong and doing it perfectly is perfectly wrong. And so the question becomes, what is the right thing to do? So the idea here is, and I humbly present this as a question of obviously well-meaning, amazing people, um, you know, who can think about things like WikiHouse or can think about circular economy or can think about supply chains with cycles. And I offer up this notion that if we could develop a way of dealing with tension and compression and spanning space and using materials that have a negative cost of goods, what I mean by that is they're cheaper than free. 
Um, in some cases, like New York, they pay $80 a ton to move plastics from New York City to Ohio to throw in a hole in the ground. They're spending money on this stuff that we could be re putting phosphate and uh, fire retardants or, or aluminum hydroxide and then developing safety for health and for all these materials so they can be perpetually engaged. So the quick idea was use tension and compression, come up with ways that you could build a home. This concept right here, this one, with the center pavilion, you can have eight bedrooms on this house at your own discretion in your own form. Go ahead. So as we developed this, we started to think, well, if we could have a roof and we could get a roof over people's heads, even in emergencies like in Syria or in, or in um, Haiti or in Pakistan after the flooding of the Indus, and we could think about ways to get you protected immediately with something that could be made with your kids even, almost like a toy, and then you could build your walls if you're in a permanent place and so on, the, underneath it in, in protection. What would it mean to start to think this through? Go ahead, next. And so as we thought about that, we started looking at what is the simplest structure we could even make out of plastic elements or with very light carbon fiber additions and so on. And you start to think about the space frame and the fact that we can create almost any module with only two elements. Go ahead. And these are very simple. These could be put together and snapped together by people uh, in, a, in a safe place with these materials that have been properly uh, engaged. Go ahead. And so the the question then became, perhaps we could develop things that allow a family to get a roof up, build a house under it, then make the roof into the home over time. And these become part of their capital formation. Instead of just putting them in a temporary tent or a container, we let them start to fabricate whatever it is that they desire for their cultural uh, and physical needs and, and start to develop a system that allows that to work. Next. And so working with Neil and, uh, and Sam and, and the folks at the Center for Bits and Atoms, we started to articulate one of our notions was one that had a kind of a folded plate roof, uh, very simple. And just remember, these are all made out of these materials that we're recovering from the detritus of the first industrial revolution as we clean up as we go. And then having this magical moment of being able to visit next with, with Neil in, at Davos and then with, with his team at MIT, and then talking to um, Sam Kalish, who's I think with you here, um, and seeing this sort of wonderful notions that if we take these elements and start to optimize around um, various kinds of new manufacturing, new addi additional manufacturing, new additional uh, techniques for uh, connecting things, and start to look at this using these cheaper than free materials, um, we can start to imagine a whole new, go ahead, next, um, universe of good. And we could imagine these materials as things that are fun to build with and put together and, and could manifest themselves in any form as desired by the people locally. Because in the end, all sustainability, like politics, is local. So we're still in the middle of exploring these ideas. And next, and if we just, as a coda, and I know we're, we're um, we're able to make this relatively quick this morning. I wanted to put this tensegrity structure up here as a coda because Buckminster Fuller looked at not just efficiency of domes and things like that, which are interesting, of course, but he also looked at the arts. And Kenneth Snelson, the great American sculptor, had developed these sculptures that were inspired Fuller to develop what he called tensegrity. But the part that I find interesting about this one, there are three elements to this. One is that it understands that it's most essential the notions of gravity here as tension and compression. You see continuous tension and discontinuous compression. And this, this form was sent to me by Thomas Zoe, Buckminster Fuller's partner, saying that Bucky Fuller, for whom I gave the 100th birthday address uh, in New York uh, and was a friend, um, had wanted me to have this because it located a single point in space that from these other points. And I find this really fascinating because if we look at the, the notion of um, the, the single point in space held in position by tension and compression, as an architect, I really want to follow the laws of gravity. I want to follow nature's laws generally. And of course, the law of gravity, you know, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. But the, the element of it that is interesting to me today, as I leave you, is not just compression 
Because I think people everywhere can start piling things up and perhaps build walls. We know how to do that kind of thing. But we could also develop tension and skins that are available to people light and free. And that, that at the same time, once you start to realize that putting a roof over people's heads and claiming a place for them to be safe and healthy um, is such a way of waging peace by design with these materials that are considered value less, but we can put them into continuous use by generations. And that this is really that third element of gravity that we haven't really uh, really focused on yet and next. And that would be the vacuum. And we have a vacuum of experience here. And with the ability to have wiki, with the ability to have con uh, collaboration around the world, with the ability to see these massive flows of materials that are going to waste, literally, we call them waste, we treat them like waste. Why would businesses make things they can't sell? Why are we making things that are toxic or un are not optimized? It doesn't make any sense. So instead of just reduce, reuse, recycle, but in most cases, we downcycle. Let's think of materials as nutrients. Let's talk about reverse logistics, getting things back, using them as services, thinking of how they return to soil safely to restore it and its health. Think about how they return to industry for a human use forever safely. Think about clean energy, clean water, and social fairness. And when we put that on the bottom, we see this is where we are today. This is where we are. We have brought ourselves to this place where we can't see, we can't breathe. We make things that are untoward in so many ways and with undefined systems. And what if we start to think of about an uplift? The lift, because when you design a roof to go over someone's head, the first load of gravity you really have to worry about is lift. It's going to go up and it's going to fly away. So there it is. I just want to uplift. Um, housing and and then take advantage of this cheaper than free material and re, rethink it all with all the wizards in the room. So I'm hoping to attract your ingenuity and please be in touch. So I'm going to ask uh, Guillaume to pan the camera so Bill can see who he's talking to. There. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Th thank you, Bill. Bye bye. And I'll speak for Bill to say he couldn't be more eager to enter into this collaboration. His schedule didn't let him come here in person, but he was eager to talk to make this connection on not less bad, but more good meets waste streams, meets the built environment in a virtuous circle. And Bill couldn't be more eager to talk to all of us. Thank you, Bill. Goodbye. Good luck.